In today's housing market, there's a lot of information out there that we are constantly digesting. And right now in the housing market, there's a whole lot of information that's giving people misinformation, scaring people away from housing. If it's time to buy, it's time to buy. If it's time to sell, it's time to sell. That's what I always tell my buyers or sellers. I think it's interesting because what I want is just do a reaction and kind of some information that's out there. I found Nick from ReVenture Consulting. He has a great YouTube channel. He gives information on the market in general. I believe he does stocks as well. But I came across this video that he did specifically about housing. I'm not trying to be combative here in any way, shape or form. There are a lot of people giving information that maybe just not may not be the right direction to look at it. Ultimately, when everything works out, we can look back at history and see what the actual truth is. So he did this video in June. We're currently in September. And so things have shifted slightly. A lot of things that he talks about in this video are actually still very similar position. What he's saying here is that, is the housing market gonna crash? We're in a similar position that we were in 2007, 2008. And 2007, 2008 was an absolute disaster. There's a few different things that were happening in 2007 and 2008 that are currently happening. So when you look at the prices being overvalued, overvalued is really a question of, what he's looking at is, he's looking at the 31% of overvalued. If you look at the actual description Description, the home prices are 31% overvalued compared to income levels in America. If you look at the income levels in America based on history, what you're taking here is you, if you look at the data that he's showing, the value is 321,835. The median income is 74,442. A couple of different things to this point. One, when you're talking about the value of the home, it's not going to be necessarily against the median income. The median income of 74,000, this is nationwide, the median income of 74,000. If you take and you break that out, it's 6203 a month. What the value that he's talking about as well, as far as the home value, 321. If you're talking about a first time home buyer, on average, you're talking about across the nation, again, and this is from Rocket Money, on average, a first time a home buyer buying up is going to have on average 13% down. So the mortgage itself is actually not going to be that 321. So you're going to have the value of the home when you talk about it overvalued. What we're also not taking into account is that now at 74,000, that debt to income income ratio has historically not been extremely low and you're talking about 31%. So we're going to get into the debt to income ratio here in a little bit. But ultimately, when you're looking at that 31% overvalued, it's not exactly what we're totally focused on. That 31% is not a, a horrific position to be in. The benefits of purchasing a home it is a hedge against inflation. I've done videos on this before. A hedge against inflation when you purchase a home and the rents go up because of inflation, your mortgage payments will stay the same. If you look at the inventory, the inventory is going to show that back in 2006, 2007, 2008, it was a buyer's market. The average inventory nationwide was actually greater than seven months. If you look at a neutral market, a neutral market is going to be six to seven months. A seller's market is less than six months. And historically today, we're in a seller's market and we have been in a seller's market for some time. But historically, if you look 2006, 2007, 2008, 2010, we're all historically buyer's markets. And now we're actually in a seller's market. Inventory is low because the buyer demand is actually strong right now. Risky mortgages, and this I have a very strong stance on disagreeing with. I was in the market back in 2006 through 2008, and I was there during the downturn and the crash because it was an absolute crash. The risky mortgages, when you're talking about a risky mortgage, you're not talk currently, what he's talking about is he's gonna go back to the debt to income ratio and nobody wants to be there. Okay, so the reason this is extremely important and I really feel that it's imperative to point out is because when we're looking at the debt to income ratio back in 2005 that he's talking about, it was a tremendous difference. Let me show you why, because at the time, the debt to income ratio, one thing to know is that now the lending standards are much tighter than they were back in 2005. And let me show you why. Because back then, the what he's talking about, the debt to income ratio being 39%, peaking out at 41%, I think he said. The most tremendous difference here is, is quite frankly, very easy. In 2004 and 2005, the debt to income ratio, all of those risky loans were there. The reason they were risky loans, they were called stated loans, stated income, stated asset loans. Now, now, the difference is that these are scores between six below 620, meaning that a FICO score that is below 620 just shows that a person has had a hard time either not building their credit or not taking care of their credit. Now, we actually have higher FICO scores on average with more money down 
as well as more equity. So on the lending standards, one thing to note about it is that that stated income, stated asset, that was specifically for the bank because if you're stating an income, now you need to prove your income with your W-2 and with your pay stub. Back then, there was no need to actually prove your income. If you had a higher FICO score, you were actually getting a better rate if you stated your income instead of proving your income because it was easier for the banks to push those loans through. And anybody who was doing loans at that time will tell you. So in 2005 and 2006, the stated income, stated asset, those were, a, were very strong, very popular loans and those were what was the risky loan. Not because of the debt to income. The debt to income, the underwriter and the bank never actually saw the proof of the debt to income. So it's a completely invalid moot point that the debt to income then is the same as the debt to income now because now everything has to be proven. And also when you're looking at the amount of equity someone has in a home means that you purchase your home for $100,000, the home is worth, now worth a million dollars. You have $900,000 worth of equity. That's what the amount of equity means. And now when we're looking at the homes, the value and the amount of equity that we actually have in these homes is much greater than what used to actually be there. And that amount of equity during the housing bubble was around 1.3. Home price gains have resulted in near record amounts of equity and that puts homeowners in a much stronger position. The housing bubble in the trillions, it was 1.3 trillion, now it's 3.1 trillion. So the amount of equity also takes a huge stance inside of this because I'm not going to have to sell or be forced to sell my home if my home is, is paid outright or if I have a tremendous amount of equity. And if I do sell my home, it's not going to be a forced sale where I have to flood the market and all of these houses are flooding the market. I'm not trying to poo poo Nick. He does a great job. His videos are fantastic. There's no question about it. If you like videos like this, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions about this, please comment below. Please reach out to me anytime. I'm always here and happy to help. Hope you're having a great day. Take care.